I actually had a what's called a silent heart attack in 2021, which prevented me from going into law enforcement, which kind of led me down a really long path into music. And I think I made the right choice. Where did the name Hyphy come from? I, I don't know if I can talk about this. Gotta shoot your shot. I didn't know what I was doing. I snuck onto stage and Lewis guys saw me on stage and tried to start like a riot and it changed my life. Dr. Fresh, how did you start working with him? Me, him, Bijou, and Shane snuck onto a like NASCAR motorsports track <laughs> to take press photos together. And we're like, Sick. oh, there's no one around us. There's no race. We'll be fine. <laughs> truck marshal came over and like yelled at us and told us we were idiots for being on the track. And like, he was just, <laughs> my bad, bro. We'll leave right now. What's one of the best experiences you've had to do media for? I got to go on Friendship this last week and Tony came halfway. So I was stranded by myself on a cruise ship with no one I knew for the first two days. Oh, shit. Wow. <laughs> so there was a lot of music exploration. I had never seen a Mr. Carmack set before. Nice. That man has so much talent. One finger alone. Matt Carey, aka Hyphy, welcome to the show, man. How are you? How, good, good. How are you doing? Good, man. As we were doing our research, we were seeing that you were involved in criminal justice and you have a degree in criminal justice before you got into music. So, we, uh, my main question is just how. When did that happen and how did you kind of change directions and get on a new path of music? Basically, when I grew up, I really wanted to go into law enforcement. And so I, I went down the path of getting my criminal justice degrees. I went to a local community college and spent some years there just getting my degrees. And yeah. I ultimately ended up having a heart issue, which prevented me from going into law enforcement, which kind of led me down a really long path into music. But Damn. ultimately, my heart prevented me from doing it. And I think I made the right choice. I'm a lot happier with what I do now. And I think I really would have regretted going down a different path. Yeah. What was a heart condition? I actually had a what's called a silent heart attack in 2021. Okay. Basically, my heart has a heart attack, but I don't have the full pronounced effect. So I had to go to the hospital. I had to be hooked up and everything. I had to be monitored for wow. the day. It was super scary. You have basically the full symptoms of having a heart attack, except you don't have a, a chemical in your blood component. Mm. And that's basically the only difference. I'm unfortunately blessed with bad hereditary genes on my heart. I was going to ask if that was, if that was hereditary or not. Yeah. Yeah. That's unfortunately, crazy. I had another one as well last year. So it's why I don't have caffeine as much anymore either. Mm. But yeah. I think everyone should not, well, not everyone has this problem, but I think a lot of people who consume caffeine drink way too much of it. Like, so. that's you, Justin. <laughs> I know, I had to cut back <laughs> not too long ago. Yeah. <laughs> I've cut down to one energy drink a day. I used to have coffee and energy drinks and like five, six hundred. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know how you slept. <laughs> I feel like that's one of those moments, Just too, it. where you can, like, you're rerouted, like something terrible happens, but it reroutes you to what you're actually supposed to be doing in life through these moments. It's like a learning lesson almost. I agree completely. Sure. I, I really felt that I had to approach it with like, this was meant to be this way. That's why this happened. Mm -hmm. And it, I've been a lot happier with that. So tell us when that point where you, your heart thing happened, what, what about that put you on the path of music after that? So my first heart thing that happened was actually the first time I ever went on tour. Arm & Hammer had flown me out for my first shows on the road. Cool. Cool. I did just a West Coast run with them, but I did not really sleep that much. I had a lot of energy drinks and was just kind of go, go, go. And my doctor told me it was a culmination of my family history as well as me kind of running my body in the ground. And from that point forward, I knew that I would be permanently disqualified from doing anything right. I wanted in another field. So I made music. Right. I doubled down on it. So we wanted to get into photography. Obviously, that's what, what you are now. You're also a tour manager, which we were kind of confused of which kind of came first or did they kind of both happen at the same time? So I actually started out as a stylist. Oh. I was really okay. into fashion and everything. That's and I, sick. <laughs> I, I was really connected with like Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Amiri, Balenciaga, like all the brands people were wearing uh, 2015 to like 2018. And I met Scott from Slender when I was playing Counter-Strike. Okay. And basically, mm. long story short, I ended up styling them. And I really enjoyed going to their shows. They'd always have me out at like whenever their friends were playing in town. But I kind of felt like 
I didn't have a work reason to be in the room, and I didn't like that feeling. I really looked up to their photographer at the time, Armand Solari, and he basically oh, the name, yeah. He's mentored me. He's probably one of my biggest influences besides Nate Vogel. But yeah, Armand helped me pick up my first camera and helped me Very shoot cool. my first show many years ago. So I owe a lot to him. But I started out as a stylist, then I became a photographer. And then I became a tour manager after okay. many years being a photographer. Makes sense. What was the first show that you shot at? I believe the first show I shot was either Said the Sky at Cornerstone Berkeley or a duo named Wait What at Cornerstone Berkeley. Okay. But I just did cool a lot idea. of local shows. Yeah, it was awesome. They have a little restaurant built into it that has like the best mac and cheese balls on earth. Yum. So oh, I, I'm close to that. I live in Hayward, dude. We live super <laughs> close to each other. So I need to go try that. <laughs> you definitely need to. I was blessed yeah. <laughs> enough to actually do my first show there in like five years two months ago with Laze Wo. And that nice. was super fun. Nice. Where did the name Hyphy come from? So, let's see. I, I don't know if I can talk about this as much, <laughs> but I used to be really into cars and the Bay Area car scene, oh, particularly huge, yeah. around 7th Street. And so I mm-hmm. used to bring certain vehicles out there and I had adopted a nickname out there, but uh, I used to be very into cars and the Bay Area scene. And that I got a sense. nickname from that culture. So that makes sense. I adopted it from there and I've held it since. I feel like the car in photography scene meshes a lot into the music and photography scene. Like, is there a lot of overlap? Did you, were you like taking pictures of cars um, at that point too? I was actually just driving, okay. driving the cars. <laughs> and so I got the nickname from Hyphy Culture in the Bay Area. It yeah. was like a movement in the <clears throat> 90s, but it evolved into more of like a side show scene, side show scene where people, you know, bring cars out, do donuts and stuff. The typical Bay Area thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> dude. It's good. And talking Bay Area, you would probably you've probably seen it too. But if you're ever driving through Oakland, there's always people on like quads and motorcycles and shit. Like, how, do you know if that's legal? Oh, absolutely not. It's just called. I didn't think blood. so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I see it all the time, and it, pretty much only in Oakland. But yeah, <laughs> I was like, I don't think that's actually street legal. <laughs> Shout out back life. <laughs> what kind of got you interested? I guess in photography instead of like the style stuff, or was it like, was there a crossover at the beginning where you're like, I'm styling these people, but then I'm also taking pictures of them? Um, I was always just styling. I never really did styling and photo side by side. I really looked up to Armand and how he carried himself backstage. Mm. And I, I kind of just wanted to be more like him. And that That's inspired cool, yeah. me to pick up a camera. He, he brought my first camera into my first show for me and let me use it. And like from that point forward, I felt like I've always wanted to help people in the same way he helped me. Yeah. There weren't very many people at the time that I got into the industry that were helping other people and like Armand did. So I, I owe a yeah. lot to him and I owe a lot to Scott Land. So yeah. shout out to yeah. I, I'm a huge Slander music fan. They're great guys. I, I owe yeah. just about everything I have to them. I would not be in the industry without them. So, so it's cool. so important to have Shout those Scott. mentors in the music industry that you can look up to. That the people that do make a path for the emerging artists to come after them. Yeah, they they lead the way for others. One hundred percent. Like it inspired me to be that way with my career, the same way that yeah. they were. So. I have a lot of respect gi- for them. Gives you motivation now. And I know it's a big part of what you just said. It's a big part of what you do now. And we'll get into that in a little bit for your, your agency that you've developed. But yeah, it's, it's almost now when you're in the position to like help others, it's, it's like you want to also set a good example, just like the people of, who set a good example for you um, and kind of pass, pass that tradition down. We saw that you snuck on stage with Little Skies. And I just want to know more about that story. That was the show that Armand may or may not have brought my camera in with me. And that was Ah. like the craziest moment ever. (laughs) I didn't know what I was doing. I was my biggest complaint now, but I snuck onto stage and uh, I was taking photos. I was wearing a white shirt, (laughs) which is, again, photographer sin number one. No bueno. (laughs) Show blacks Um, only. But it was crazy. Lil guys saw me on stage and he started to climb the stage and tried to start like a riot. And it was the craziest moment ever. I, I recorded the whole thing on my old Nikon camera. But long story short, Insomniac really did not like what he was doing. And they removed him from oh. the stage oh. and he did not finish his set. Wow. So interesting. 
I got to take photos yeah. for like four minutes on stage and it changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's good. We were talking a little bit about Insomniac yesterday, prepping, and yeah, it's, we think that, at least for me, I think other people are throwing better festivals and taking care of crowds out there, but it's good to hear that they actually, like, if something like that was a riot was happening, that they actually like, took care of it and, like, kicked yeah. off stage. <laughs> yeah. I would say they really have the market handled, like, throwing festivals. Yeah. I don't think anyone throws as many as them to the extent they do. Mm-hmm. So. That's true. That's true, Yeah. Always enjoy Insomniac Fest. A big part of getting your name out as a solopreneur is emailing and cold emailing. And I know that's a topic that you wanted to kind of get into. And I think it's surprisingly how how many people that I talk to, they're like, how do you email all these people for your podcast? How do you reach out to all these people? And it's like, their email is like right there. So just, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know that's a big part of like getting your name out there for photography too. Cold emailing is one of the scariest things to begin doing, oh, especially yeah. as like, <laughs> A solopreneur. There's nothing more defeating than not getting a response at all. So shout out the managers that tell you at least they booked someone. Mm -hmm. I used to share my cold email template in the Discord that I run to help people. And it was really helpful. Basically, I always tell people when you're cold emailing, keep it simple, stupid, kiss. Short, simple, sweet. Why? Who you are, why you're emailing, what you're looking to get from the email, and what they will gain from the email if you're trying to like Mm -hmm you know, propose something here, but mm-hmm. very I mean, busy. important too. It is. You can always yeah. build off it. You can always change it. But like when you start adding too much to it, you might not have the full email read by some yeah. people and you might really miss That's out. Too wordy. So Done. Yeah. It is too wordy. A lot of people <laughs> don't have that time to read it, which is very sad to say, but yeah, for the sure. shorter the email, the better chance you'll have of getting a response. But yeah. never feel too intimidated to send an email. You'll never know who's going to respond. Most of the time, it's I. Most of the time, it's just like a not reply. Like the not reply means no. Yeah. There's yeah. very few times that I've experienced that we've sent out a lot of emails that I experienced that like people actually like. Which I honestly I appreciate when people are like no instead of just leaving me on red or whatever. But most of the time, it's a no response anyways. So it's like. What, you're not even you shouldn't even really be afraid of a no it's usually you just don't get an email back it's nothing more defeating though you like go through that effort you yeah. want to make that <laughs> connection you want to do this work for them and then it's just like no response yeah yeah that's true that's true just got to shoot your shot most people get their their start by volunteering too and i know i did um i, I had to work for free for many years but as a photographer and i've talked to slacker you brought up slacker uh, previously um about the same topic when he was on the show, but the time of like, how, how did that work for you? And how much time did you have to like work for free? And how do you still sometimes work for free for favors or trade work or whatever? I say working for free is kind of like something that's heavily stigmatized. I feel like if yeah. you don't know what you're doing, I don't think you should be charging money. Like if you're going to a show, yeah. you're not knowing how to shoot in manual. You're not knowing to like underexpose this. So that you maybe shouldn't be charging for a delivered product because you're not sure what the product you're going to deliver is. If you know that you're going to be able to go and get like 10 good photos or like five good videos or at least something that you can guarantee you're going to deliver, I think that's when you start charging. At the same time, like people are getting paid different rates. So like the same rate, say Fisher is getting paid. The guy who's opening at Cornerstone is not going to be making that money. Mm-hmm. I won't go charge that guy Fisher's rate. Like I, I, if that guy is getting $100, I'm not even going to ask for more than 50 Like, Right. There is a balance when you get to a certain level of when you know what you're doing, where you don't have to charge certain people as much, where it won't hurt other people. If it is like a local show, it is a local artist, but it is someone you believe in, Go work for them. Go support their project. Mm-hmm. I've I've worked for many artists who couldn't pay half my rate, but at the same time, I had a blast working for them, and I still work for them to this day. It, music is not really about the money. Yeah, there's a a thin line of where it is and isn't about the money, and it becomes about the money when you're wasting your time or someone's taking advantage of you. There's some people who unfortunately will do that, and being able to recognize that is a big thing. If there is an artist that you know is selling out. A show they they should be paying you for media if they're booking you regardless, right? But yeah, uh, you shouldn't charge money if you don't know what you're delivering. If yeah. someone <laughs> isn't this headline artist, you shouldn't be charging them headline money. But at the well, same how, time, you how sh- do you? Is there like an industry standard? I guess for like headline money, like is is there like like how do you gauge that rate? 
I would say the standard photo and raws rate for anything that doesn't require travel, anything local would be like $500 a set. Okay. I would oh, okay. say that's just, if you look at anyone, they're charging $500 minimum for photo and raw clips. I mm -hmm. haven't done my minimum right now is a thousand dollars, so I will okay. gladly share that for twenty twenty four for booking me thousand dollars <laughs> photo and Ross, hello. But I would say five hundred had become the industry standard last year. It's what we were pushing for on the SF market for a lot of people. Okay. It's come a long way. It used to be about a hundred dollars five yeah, six dude. years ago. And yeah. shout out John Slack, Eric, basically everyone who's held their ground and helped everyone else who didn't know what to charge bring mm -hmm. the rate up to something more normal for I know that, that was a big topic that we talked about yeah yeah he, and he was definitely one of those anyway. pioneers yeah John has done so much for the Bay Area music scene like I can't say how much respect I have for him so cool I'm happy now that you guys can charge your actual value too instead of having to undersell yourself because you are bringing a legitimate product to the table that is worth just as much is like production or any other huge facet that these artists need to be need to be need to have to continue their career to continue to push their marketing i agree completely like i don't know very many artists who can go do a show and like have people talking about it unless they're like skrillex or chris lake like mm -hmm. you have to have proof the show happened you have to have yeah. some cool proof this happened the social yeah. media is not going to talk about it as much as say oh here's 10 photos from like the 50,000 people who are at my show. Does that price become different when there's video involved? Video, I mean, when there's a creative working for someone, they're going to have so mm. many like things that are factored in. I think yeah. like a blanket rate would just be like the photo raw clip deliverable has been very standard for like okay. EDM creatives. Like when I'm getting booked, people are asking me to do like 30 photos and like 10 plus raw clips. And I would say 90% of the other bookings are going to be very close to that yeah the very few people are going for recaps and like the longer form videos unless it's a dedicated videographer on like an artist project which i love to see that but I, it's a much more dying breed thing to see like chris yoder yeah. used to make these insane like four minute recaps that i grew up watching and i will never forget watching his stuff from 2016 2017 because it inspired everyone who i got into the industry with to make their videos right. and right, you'll see right. all these influences from chris yoder and their films so i miss that era but unfortunately we're now in the 15 second tiktok era mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah dude <laughs> or the long format podcast stuff <laughs> the long format podcast yeah. stuff too yeah yeah short and sweet so interesting how there's the current market of like content creation is like either extremely long format like YouTube, but you go on YouTube, all the creators, no one's really vlogging anymore. It's all podcast stuff. It's like, it's just a podcast plus podcast platform that YouTube's turned into, but then they have like shorts and TikToks, and it's like such polar opposite lengths and things. That it's like, it doesn't make sense why they can, they can pine together, but it's the market that we're in, I guess. <laughs> I agree completely. Yeah. Uh, YouTube's my favorite <laughs> platform. So I, it's so funny to see like the two hour videos. And I was like, Oh, here's mm -hmm. a 30 second short. Mm -hmm. The duality of some people have that really long attention span, but not everyone does. Talking a little further into the, the money stuff, when do you, as a photographer, like, and I know we brought up John Slack too, you know, being the pioneer in this, but being taken advantage of as a photographer, like, how do you stand your ground? How do you politely, you know, go, like, make sure you don't get taken advantage of, basically? <laughs> I would say the hardest thing really is saying no. When you're new and you're naive, people are poisoning everything as like, this is an opportunity for you. But in the reality of it is, it's like, you're scratching my back and I'm going to call it an yeah. opportunity. <laughs> and like, there's a lot of smaller photographers that I'll try to like point out like, hey, this guy's probably making like $5,000 a show and he's giving you like $50. Like, I don't agree with that at all. And so I'll I'll step in and I'll be like, hey, this guy's taking advantage of you. And I'll hope that they'll see it from like the mm -hmm. perspective I'm seeing it as, but sometimes they don't and it is what it is and they'll have to learn another way. But there are unfortunately some teams that will only be looking out for the artist on the project and I, you won't see me work with them, but they do exist. Yeah. And it's sad because there's a lot of really talented creatives that will get stuck in this cycle where they think like, all of the clients are going to treat me this way or like this is a reasonable expectation of a client to 
pay me this much and expect this much out of me. But then you get to go work for people like Dr. Fresh and it will completely change that perspective. You'll, you'll see it from a mile away at that point. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it sounds like there's a lot of like looking out for one another too. in in the photography like side of things. There is, I think community is a huge part of that because all creatives speak to each other. And so when one is done wrong by some team, 5,000 others will hear from it very quickly after photographers do look out for each other. That's very cool. What are some of your tips for not being overwhelmed as a photographer at like a larger show or festival, or how do you regulate yourself when you're in those situations? I would say a big thing is kind of getting a lay of the land. It can be really overwhelming when you're like thrown into a show, you arrive on site with an artist and you didn't have time to like walk around the outside of the venue or, where you're going to be shooting. And like, I like to scout my shots. So maybe 30 minutes before a set, an hour before a set, I'll walk around the venue and I'll be like, cool, this will be like a really good wide shot from this corner. Mm -hmm. And that way, when it's like the time for the set, when you only have 60 minutes to get your photos, I know exactly where I'm going to be going to. I know exactly the staircase that's going to be the quickest way to get there. And like, a lot of it is pre-planning for when you actually have to work. That's interesting. I never looked at it that way. Yeah, I mean, you realistically only have 60 minutes to get the photos you want. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do is I like planning all 60 minutes. I don't sit down for a set. So I will plan where I'll be the first 10 minutes if I'm on the booth. And then if I run stage left and I'll go to the back of the crowd. But I like building routes because I'll always come back to my bag on stage and I'll swap my lens and I'll run my new route. And it's a lot of meticulous pre-planning, but it makes the set a lot easier and a lot less stressful. Since I've you, started pre-plan and I, I haven't felt very overwhelmed in like two or three years. So I highly recommend cool. it. Yeah. You had an interesting question, Hallie, uh, about frying la- uh, yeah, sensors. Yeah. Have you ever had a laser fry your sensor on your camera? I fried three phones. I fried two GoPros and I fried one Canon 5D Mark IV. Okay. I just saw Jason Odagio, another super talented photographer, fry his laser on friendship this last week during Gary Destructo's sunrise sermon set, he put his 1D on a camera a monopod and went straight in the air right as the lasers hit and he lost his whole oh, camera. Oh no. Just, it just Damn. puts, you'll either get like a vertical line where the laser hit, but the one that his, his, hit his camera were so strong, he had a massive X hmm. through his camera. It was completely unusable the rest of the weekend. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, I didn't even know that was a thing until the Hallie brought it up. You know more about cameras mm-hmm. than I do, but damn, <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> it's like my biggest fear. Yeah. <laughs> I always will go talk to the laser tech on site and just ask where like the protection zones of the laser are. So that doesn't happen. And also and part of your route. Yeah. Also yeah. part of the route. Yeah. Unfortunately, if there are stage vibrations and they're not rigged well to the stage, they can get out of skew, which is how Jason lost his. Mm. So Poor Jason. I, I, I remembered what I was going to ask you. How many, because you were talking about the quantity of deliverables, how many pictures do you, do you only take that amount of pictures or do you overtake pictures and then choose the best ones? So I, I'll definitely overtake photos and I'll choose the best one. I like to end each photo with like a thousand unedited photos and then I'll pull down to there to like my 50 favorite and my average deliverables will be like 50 plus photos and 10 plus raw clips. But Sometimes I'll take like 6,000 photos if it's right. EDC or wow. some crazy set where I want to have like most immaculate 50. Mm-hmm. I will take a lot of photos. But that's, that's a, I feel I'll, like that's a good game plan, I think, too. It's just like instead of just hoping for the best on those specific ones, it's like, okay, shoot a bunch and then yeah, choose the best ones out of all that. Yeah. A lot of my shooting style and a lot of low light in general is you're shooting for the burst of like the club. So you'll have mm. maybe... 10 dark photos and one with proper exposure where the flash actually comes in. So a lot of it is a waiting game as well or yeah. waiting for the artist's hand to be perfectly in the air right. rather than them doing that, touching their face movement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's a lot of little variables you're looking for. Yeah. You brought up Dr. Fresh. How did you start working with him? And yeah, I know you're primarily only working for him now, right? Yeah. Uh, I feel yeah. very blessed to be full time with Tony. So Love sick. that guy to death. He seems like a really cool guy. <laughs> I met him when I was working with Bijou in Salt Lake City a few years back. Just kind of ran into him. He was best friends with Bijou at the time. And 
Mm-hmm. I'd seen him live a few times and I was always impressed, but never personally met him. Me, him, Bijou, and Shane from Acre Media, shout out him, snuck onto a like NASCAR motorsports track <laughs> to take press photos together. And we're like, Sick. oh, there's no one around us. There's no race. We'll be fine. And <laughs> the track, <not. laughs> track marshal came over and like yelled at us and told us we were idiots for being on the track. And like seeing how Tony reacted so positive, he just giggled. He was just, <laughs> my bad, bro. We'll leave right now. It was just the funniest thing to me. But. That's very cool. So from there, went, yeah, from there, you when was that? Uh, that was, I want to say... The first, I think, festival I did back from the pandemic, it was a social distance. We had like these metal pods and mm-hmm. I, I remember think the Mutiny Motorsports put it on at the Utah Motorsports Complex. But I had a great time there. From there, Tony and I just started doing festivals together and it grew more and more to the point that we just started touring together. And That's we've cool. been touring together two years now. So. Very cool. What is life like being on the road on these tours? It's a lot of go, go, go. It's a lot of really early lobby calls, unfortunately. I don't fly out of a traditional airport, so I unfortunately am always connecting on my flights as well. So I Where usually, do you fly out of from? I fly out of Sacramento Airport now. Okay. Why? I live, I live a lot more near Tahoe now. I actually don't really live in ah, San Francisco okay. anymore. Got so it. it's just a lot closer for me, but at the same time, it's a lot more calm. I would rather connect and have a really easy travel day at the airport than going to SFO and being stressed yeah. out of my mind to make my flight. Fair. I grew up in Sacramento, so Sacramento, I'm very familiar with that airport. <laughs> it's the best. I, I've very think nice I've flown every midsize airport in the U.S. now, and there's nothing better in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. It it, it does suck that it's not an inter, like it, it is a connecting airport or whatever, but it is a, a nice one to fly out of. It has like 70 directs now. I can go Toronto. I went to Miami direct. Damn. So. That's it's good. I'm glad they're more building options. on it. Yeah. 100%. I bet taking care of yourself on the road is probably, I mean, you were talking about your heart and you were talking about caffeine and consumption and all that. Now that you've cut back on that, is it harder to pull the amount of hours that you're, that you're running? And it ha- does diet have anything to do now with, you know, keeping you alive and running? <laughs> I would say on the road, there's very few variables that you have control over. Yeah. Diet, unfortunately, don't have that many options. It's you're yeah. either eating at the airport, you're getting Uber Eats to the hotel, or you're hoping you have time between sound check and the show to eat. Just like sleep, there, there's not very many variables you have control over for your health. And so having the most control will help you. Your first tour, you're not going to be healthy. You're not going to be sleeping. Yeah. You're not going to know what you're doing. But over time, you'll you'll build what works for you. When you're able to work with someone consistently, you'll be able to find like a good balance for Tony and I, I'll airdrop them all the phone clips and I'll be able to sleep on it. I won't have to touch the photos until cool. like I'm on the flight the next day or like it makes sense. Yeah. But there's some people who are like, I want everything the next morning. You're not sleeping that tour. Mm-hmm. And that's the unfortunate <laughs> reality of it. You have four hours to sleep at most after the show and you're editing. Is it usually the artist who's requesting that or is it like the management or it it can be both both i would say for the most part it's usually the artist requesting it because most of the artists are the ones also doing their social media unless they're Mm -hmm. having a firm do it so yeah yeah. it's usually the artist requesting that but it's become a lot less common to ask for overnight deliverables unless you're doing like a large show Mm. that's good take some pressure off yeah 100 percent it's just not realistic to like have d- expect some dude to work for three days straight on no sleep. Yeah. <laughs> You're just not going to get anything good from it. Will you tell us more about you as tour managing and what that job entails versus photography or maybe how they overlapped? I started tour managing for other artists before Tony okay. and they would need a lot more like they would need me to handle the production. I need to do the full advance and stuff now. But basically with Tony, I'll go in, I'll plug in his USB, I'll make sure like the levels are fine on the mixer and I'll go stand in the crowd for him to do his sound check. It's just making sure the show goes well, kind of mm-hmm. for me. I'm not doing as much advancing per se on his project. It's a lot more of like on-site road tour management. Mm-hmm. If yeah. there's anything that will go wrong with like the visuals, I'll, I'll go sort that out with the VJ. It's kind of just waiting for something to go wrong because something <laughs> will always go wrong and just being prepared for it, I guess. 
it, you, it's basically you're just like the go-to guy if you're like yeah. the go-to guy on the road so that Tony doesn't have to do it himself. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. yeah. There's a lot more like intense TM gigs where yeah. you have to basically, you won't be able to do media as much, but since I'm doing both, it's the perfect balance for me. That's cool. My brain works on logistics and charts and numbers mm-hmm. and everything. So being able to like know when the flight is, I'll tell Tony exactly how long we're in the air, exactly what part of the flight the turbulence oh, will that's hit. Cool. Like I'm very meticulous with He probably all appreciates planning. that too. Uh, he appreciates it. I yeah. appreciate it. But it's just a lot of really fine tuned things that we've developed together that work for us. But there's a lot more traditional TM roles as well. So what do you think got you to into that position with him and why have you why do you think he chose you out of god knows how many options he had at the time i think we just really get along i i looked at tony like an older brother yeah Yeah. like i bring my dad out to shows with tony cool sick tony's (laughs) like an older brother to me i don't know it doesn't feel like work it doesn't feel like he's my boss it it feels like you're going on the road with your best friend and Mm -hmm. going to these cool places and like it's why it works it's a very stressful job there's things flying at a thousand miles an hour and there's a lot of like bad things that can pop up out of nowhere but getting to work with someone like that makes it worth everything yeah what is your what has been like your biggest challenge i guess like stepping into that role i get really overwhelmed sometimes and so i will sometimes get really stressed out and i i don't handle it that well i'll I'll kind of just clam up and i'll blank Mm. um but he's very good at recognizing that in me. I think I have like a visible sign on my face when I'm that way. And he calms me down and then I'm good from there. But I would just say the stress. It's a very yeah. stressful position. And like if someone is yelling at me, I I can't respond well to loud people. And so I'll usually freeze up then. But other than that, I love my job. But the stress can definitely be the hard part of it. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a favorite person that you've been on tour with or shot for or even maybe like a subgenre or just like what's one of the best experiences you've had to do media for i really like house music i'll never say no to a house or like a techno mm-hmm. set it's definitely where i align with a lot of the people that i work with that do like bass or dubstep i'm really big fans of them as people i'm really big fans of their project and what they're doing like calcium i think yes that guy Fire. is so talented like I I feel so blessed just hearing him talk about his production and like what goes into it. I mean, he plays an all original set. It's one of the youngest guys I get to work with. And that's my true appreciation of music. It's like, it's when it's your life. Mm-hmm. You wake yeah. up every day and it, your brain thinks in this creative sense and it's all you know. Like, really just anyone who appreciates music, it's the biggest driving force to me is being passionate about what you do. So like, You don't have to make a specific music that I like listening to, but if you're all about the music you play, I want to hear it. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's not what I listen to. If if you care about the music you're playing, I want to hear it. I got to go on Friendship this last week, and there were so many artists I'd never heard of before, and a whole other story for another day, but Tony came halfway, so I was stranded by myself on a cruise ship with no one I knew for the first two days. (laughs) So there was a lot of music exploration, and I got to see so many people. Like I had never seen a Mr. Carmack set before. Nice, oh so good. See, Uh. I thought I'd see like three or four of his sets on the ship. That man has so much talent in one finger alone. Like (laughs) he really got into it, and seeing him play like a classic hip hop set. Yeah, that's. That's where my love for music is. People who love what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How how often do you get in those situations where like you're, you just like where you got stranded or like you get stuck somewhere and you're just like, well, now I just get to enjoy this. <laughs> Not that often. It was almost like a vacation. Very rarely. It, it's only been like I had a set a few years ago where I was actually with John Slack as well, where the artist was like late to the set and I didn't have to mm. shoot. So John Slack and I got to watch Chris Lake play his first San Francisco block party together. And him and I put a pack of uh, Jeter's on stage and just had, I will never forget that night. It's so cool. Yeah, Yeah, it's cool. I've I've had it moments like that too, where it's like, sometimes it just, it's just work. And then other times where it's like, this is why I do this. (laughs) It was one of those moments for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We want to get into our, kind of our last topic, and I know we've kind of touched on it, and I, I said we were going to talk about it later, but your agency, your Discord channel, and kind of the mission behind that. 
kind of how I was talking about earlier, when I got into the industry myself, there weren't very many people who were like sharing what they were doing that was working or like kind of providing a path in for others. And Armand provided that for me. Scott provided that for me. Nate provided that for me. Derek provided that for me. And like, mm-hmm. I always wanted to return that. I, I was never able to like express to them how much it meant to me that they did that for me when no one else was doing that at that time. So it became my mission that if I were ever able to do that for other people, I would do that. I started mentoring someone named Kane. He goes by Kangaroo on Instagram, super talented photographer. Cool. And someone named Drake as well. And someone named Drew. Um, Drake and Drew, I don't think are really doing photography as much anymore, but Kang is now touring with Bijou and a few other people. Very cool. But they were the first people that I was able to actually mentor. And they were the ones who I was able to like see the impact I had being able to do that for others. And it really inspired me to do more and more. And so I last, I guess now 2022 of November, I created No Travel and I wanted it to start as like a community for other photographers and creatives and I really felt like at that time, our morale in our community was really low. There were a lot of other people coming in and kind of negatively affecting it, whether they were blanket charging a really low rate and taking work from people who do it for a living or kind of just not caring for how they were affecting everyone else in the industry. So it grew into more of a community rather than an agency. And it banded a bunch of creatives together and it The first three months we had a call every single Tuesday was like the weekly 4 p.m. call. And we would get up to like 150 creatives in one Discord call just helping others and being like, this is how you send an email or like, this is what you do on your first festival set. This is how you get Mm -hmm. insurance. Like we realized at that point we never had the avenues to ask questions to like advance other creatives. And at the time there weren't very many touring creatives. We've had probably 15, 20 kids from there go on tours now who picked up a camera a year and a half ago. Wow. And it's because they were able to have these questions answered. We work in such like a specific hyper niche of what (laughs) we do. and None of us are doing it for the money. So, I mean, we must really Mm -hmm. love what we're doing. I think everyone's able to recognize that in the creatives on there. And it's why the community is so like responsive to each other. There's no one being like, that's a stupid question. Like, no, I guarantee you someone else had that question mm-hmm. too. Like, it's a very Even, positive, uplifting community. And it warms my heart to have that exist. That's so cool. Yeah, that's kind of what, what we're striving for with this podcast too. And just providing that place for like a resource for people to like learn it from other people's stories. So I think that's amazing what you guys are doing. What is gatekeeping to you or how have you seen that in your career? I would say gatekeeping. I mean, people call it sharing the sauce <laughs> when someone gatekeeps, okay. like the camera settings or like how to edit in a specific way. And like, I don't agree with that. Like yeah. you can go on YouTube and look at how to do it or you can help some guy. It takes like five minutes out of your day. Mm-hmm. I always tell people if they have any questions, so like message me on Discord or message me on Instagram and I'll respond. Like mm-hmm. the door between me and helping someone follow their dreams is always going to be open. It's what I believe in. And I think very many other people have adopted that as well. Like there were a lot of older photographers who never really shared the sauce traditionally. (laughs) And I think they were able to see the effects that no travel had. I think they were more concerned that like new photographers were going to come in and like damage the market or like affect their clients. And And I think they realized it was just a bunch of people who shared the same passion as them. Mm -hmm. And they were a lot more warm, a lot more responsive after that point. Everyone gets along now. You see Rooks is in there every single day, damn near. Like, oh, that's cool. I was going to bring Responding to people. Yeah. Yeah. This guy's been the number one DJ he's photographer. All, and he's always been a man of many few words, very private, very not serious shit from what I've heard and seen from him. Yeah. He's very quiet, very to yeah. himself. I respect the hell out of it. But yeah. at the same time, he is helping new photographers. That's so maybe cool. Maybe shot two shows. Like. I, that's what I have respect for. It's, it's so not cool. going to hurt him. It's not going to affect his bookings, yeah. anything like that. It's cool that you have a place that's doing that too, where you're like, you're not really making money from it. Like you I, mentioned, I'm not like, making any money from yeah. it. I mean, it's a not a for profit. Like, a lot of people would see that where they're like, oh, I have the secrets or I have like the sauce, as you say, and it, they would turn it into a business of trying to sell that. You know what I mean? And you're just gladly doing it for free. So that's And so here's cool. my online content hoping- course. <laughs> it's what yeah, everyone's right. going yeah. for. <laughs> There's not like a a money pay here or play here, but 
we are hoping to launch an agency from it in this coming year mm. that will help place like a tour that maybe doesn't have the budget to fly someone for every show, but we'll you help them source from... like a local market. Here's That's the 20 so cities you need a photographer. Yeah. And like, it's Damn. all people who've been a part of this community. It's a way to give back to them. And like, so that cool. would be the only way, like, I'm not looking to turn profit out of this. It's, mm. I just want to help other people. It's what I'm about. That's and awesome. so it's, it's grown a lot more out of creative. So I, I do want to throw that in there. After doing a couple of tours with Tony, we realized how important it was to have like VJs and LDs and audio techs when we're not trying to fly someone out as much. And so we've yeah. opened the Discord up to any aspect, whether it's artists looking for media, artists looking for press, song covers, anything they need, managers. It's open for any role of the music industry. Well, we just put in our application yesterday. So Signed up for your Discord. You're already, you're already in. <laughs> oh, sick, you're already perfect. in. I already approved you. <laughs> Beautiful. I saw you last night. Awesome. But. Yeah, I'm excited. That's, it seems like such a great community. I'm excited to get to know everyone in there. I wanted to ask, just like, in your opinion, why do you think that has been such, I mean, now it's changing with people like you and I and you know, us, all of us, sorry. But why do you think it's been such a thing in the industry for people to gatekeep or keep their secrets? Or is it just like money, you think? I think electronic music generally used to be a lot smaller and the pay yeah. used to be a lot smaller. And like it was really hyper focused. And as electronic music is definitely becoming the sound of our generation, I think mm -hmm. people are a lot more willing to work with others. And it's progressively happened. I think it was just a lot more gate kept because there weren't that many clients to go around that were touring right. before. And like now everyone people wants to were do worried. It. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Now everyone wants to do it. I mean, TikTok real. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it has changed everything that we do and people are looking at it a lot differently, but I would say the exclusivity is a reason that people gate kept it before mm -hmm. for sure. But now we don't have to deal with that. I'm thankful for that. Yeah, for sure. What is like, so what did the brand no travel did it come from the like the idea of like the the sourcing like you were talking about or just people not having to travel to do gigs yeah it kind of came from just not having to fly someone out to do a gig being like no travel required no travel agency we're gonna hire someone local like for the most part a lot of people are just wanting to hire local right now and very yeah. few artists are looking to pick up someone full-time like probably can name 10 on my finger yeah, <laughs> it's gonna respond back i believe in the future where artists are gonna want to have someone full-time on their project documenting what they're doing because they're gonna see the effects that these other artists have like mm. belchery with mikey eptic and seeing what he does there like jesse with space laces or yeah yeah you see these videographers and these photographers behind these artist projects and you know them for working with this artist you know all this artist content as being created mm -hmm. by this person and I think we'll see that return soon, but for right now, reels and TikToks are not yeah. going to allow that to happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see if that ever, I mean, everything changes eventually. Eventually, we'll hit, something new will come out, but it'll be interesting to see what TikTok and like that form of content turns into. <laughs> yeah, I every, spend every single day trying to figure out what it's doing. Yeah, yeah. It's VR and AI, and that's a whole separate conversation, but yeah. It's going to be interesting. It, did, what does the community look like? Is it all EDM people? It's all industry. I have manually approved all, I think there's like 1,100 people yeah. in there right now. And I know every single person in there. I've looked at your Instagram. I've verified cool. that you're working in the industry. But it's a very positive community. We've had to ban one person ever. And it was just someone who was very grouchy at the world. Yeah. So yeah. don't be grouchy. Be nice yeah. to others. Like, yeah. Be supportive. Not be asking a good for person. a lot here. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. Awesome. Well, we are getting close to wrapping up here, but before we do go ahead first and plug the, the agency, how do people join? How do people get, you know, become a part of it if they want to? Feel free to check us out on Instagram. The handle is no travel agency. If you go to notravel.org, it's a direct link to join the Discord. We may be having a website coming soon. Not sure yet, but Instagram is definitely the easiest way. There will always be cool. a link in my bio as well. So awesome. feel free to reach out. Sweet. Awesome.
Well, being that this is our first interview together, Hallie, I'm going to let you ask the famous last question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this is what Justin asked everybody on the interview. I'm honored to be asking it right now. Uh, but is there one piece of advice that you would tell yourself when you first started doing photography and what would that be? That's a great question. <laughs> Don't give up. It, there was a lot of moments where I really hit burnout and I was really just like, I don't want to do this anymore. And like, I there were a lot of times stuff. with my, yeah, a lot yeah. of it was around health and just, yeah. you really will. I think if you want to be successful, you have to go through the trenches. And when I was going through the trenches, I really wanted to give up. So don't give up because I guarantee it will be worth it. And when you get to that point, you will never give up. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. nothing will phase you at that point. So. Yeah, just don't sure. stop going it you may feel like you hit a wall but it's right on the other side of that wall absolutely nice. awesome thank you so much for your time man it was great talking to you thank you so much for having me it was i feel very honored to have been here thank you thanks Matt.